what we're talking about when we say anti-aging, quote unquote, what we're really talking about is a paradigm shift from treating or suppressing symptoms or chasing symptoms to prevention. You're That's- absolutely right. Up to this point, it's been prevention. But now we're at a point where we're looking at regression where we're looking at being able to augment our stem cells. We're able to go in there and stimulate our body's repair processes. The new senolytic drugs actually get rid of old cells, zombie cells, you know, some people call them. And when our cells get old, they kind of just, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, they're in a nursing home. They just kind of sit around, they don't do their job, and they're lazy. And worse than that, they create some toxic proteins, which further stimulate aging. And so in animals, we're finding that the use of senolytic drug therapies can increase life expectancy alone, maximum life expectancy, not mean life expectancy, by 30%. We have, uh, yeah, uh, numerous supplements and things that increase uh, telomerase. And we had talked about in the show some time ago that we can actually measure DNA and we are finding out which things affect it. And some of the most effective things for um, having the best telomerase length are, are some nutraceuticals, but hormones too. When the hormones are replenished, I know is a huge pillar allowing people to not just go into a decline, but actually regenerate if they're starting to decline. We can intervene, get back to where we were. As soon as we wake up and notice that our activity, um, how we go through our day, how sharp we are, isn't as great as we want it to be. In those moments that we wake up, there's so many tools to actually improve and improve I think beyond our wildest dreams. You're absolutely right. You know, when I when when I first started anti aging medicine in 1991, there was only about seven interventions, or uh, when I say even interventions, but about therapies, even drugs, mm-hmm. you know, that might have a beneficial effect for anti aging. You know, most of it was exercise and diet, which is still very important, but we didn't have a lot of drugs. We didn't have a lot of interventions. Today, there's over 50, probably closer to 100, well accepted interventions, drug therapies, other things that can have a direct benefit with regard to improving the function and more and normalizing or youth or or you I don't want to say I'm looking for the right word, but uh, a, a drug that brings us more back to a youthful norm than uh, simply treats a symptom. This is very exciting because all it takes is one, just one single breakthrough drug, and the whole paradigm changes. The whole thing of aging changes. Just like in 2005, Joey Heatherton was the first woman over 35 to ever get on the cover of Playboy. (laughs) Oh, wow. Why is that important? (laughs) It's important because women were not seen as sexy, youthful, vibrant, after the age of 35, they were dried up. You know, their hormones were gone. They're, they're, you know, they were no longer childbearing. That was it. Game over. You know, you know. Sorry, sorry, ladies. You know, you, 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 you've done your thing. You've done your service. Now, you know, go in the go in the back room and knit. Okay. <laughs> but in but in 2005, this wasn't long ago. This this no, that isn't. Okay, she broke the mold. She got on the cover of Penthouse, and she looked great. I mean, she was like 52 and awesome. And now you have women who are, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, Sophia Loren. I have a lot of respect for her. I have a lot of respect for her. And she's getting great results, and those results are available to everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is the, you know, what is most astounding to me is people have the shortest-term memories I mean, we're like goldfish. I mean, think about it. When I grew up, and I'm not that old, ICUs, because I started in healthcare very early, mm-hmm. the intensive care units were filled with people, some in their 40s, the late 40s, but in their late 40s, 50s, 60s. You go into intensive care units today, it's rare to see anyone under the age of 70 unless it's trauma. Very interesting. There's been a, there's been a real quantum shift 
in regard to what aging-related disease is. When I was a kid, someone died when they were 60-something. It was, well, they had a good long life, you know, lucky mm-hmm. guy, right? Mm-hmm. Made it to 60, yep. right? Today, someone dies in their 60s, it's like, oh, what a tragedy. He was just such a young man. He was a, practically <laughs> a, a kid, you know? Yeah, because she was. <laughs> you know exactly. And someone, it, it, if someone dies before the age of eighty-five today, it's like they died too soon. And it's true. It's uh-huh. true. They did die too soon. You know, someone, especially if they're healthy. If they're healthy and they're under the age of eight, uh, under the age of eighty, it's like a tragedy. And that's going to continue to ratchet up if we can overcome the environmental. Uh, assault on public health, but that's a different story altogether. Oh, that's but an important it, story. It's a base that all of this is teetering on. I th- unfortunately true. Unfortunately true. I wanted to talk about, someone sent me a blood test of a friend of theirs, an, a man in his late 50s who was suffering panic attacks, but didn't tell me history, just said, could you look at this blood test? I look at this blood test and I said, this is a man who's depressed. He can't feel good. And I had an elevated CRP. I had a testosterone in the 198 range. I had a DHEA that that was so low. So he was wide open to inflammatory diseases. He was he didn't have enough hormone to literally face life and to relate to life. And it when I did find out about him, yes, he was having panic attacks, he wasn't feeling well. And I could see that directly just from a blood test. Right. Uh many of the people that were talking about that do want to age um, in in a better fashion are doing things. They're they're uh, finding practitioners who can coach them in in better lifestyle choices. Or I love Dave Asprey's idea of uh, biohacking that each of us as an individual can make ch- changes in our lives and in what we do, what we eat, uh, what supplements we use. And and do end of one studies one person in the study ourselves and we can conduct these studies ourselves by looking for the outcomes. What kind of outcomes are we uh, trying to get with um, with this? Now, what as long as you can plot metabolic changes with laboratory or with physical um, functional testing, mm-hmm. you can, in fact, yeah, you can, in fact, do research on, on one person. This uh, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, you know, $2.5 billion cost for any new drug development. That's so much. How can I say it? Uh, I that's, say it. Uh, that's a huge waste of money. And First it's of all, a- the whole premise is wrong. Uh, nobody has. I think we're going to have a class in the Titans here, the uh, pharma ideal of Every a drug for everybody, and everybody takes the same strength. And then we're we're having more and more research being done on our genetics and trying to understand what SNPs predict what. And we're going to find that we're really we're not genetically made to be taking these kinds of things. It's not going to have the desired outcome. 